Hey there, thank you for stopping by on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to find out more about Lara's Church Secunda, or hoping to find a sermon to listen to, you're in the right place. We upload content weekly, so come back regularly for any updates, or click the subscribe button below, and let us let you know when new content has been uploaded. For more information, visit our website at www.lighthousechurch.co.za. Thanks once again for stopping by. So, it's New Year, everyone has these New Year's resolutions and you have these hyper-religious folk that have an issue with New Year's resolutions because they say, well, but they have a whole lot of stuff to say, stop listening. I love the idea of New Year's resolutions. I, love the, I think we, the idea that we take stock of our lives and we say, this is what needs to be different and I'm going to go to church more and I'm going to booze less and I'm going to stop these habits, I'm going to change these lifestyle habits and I'm going to do something different with my family. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think every term, every quarter, we should have a new term resolution where we go, this term it'll be different. This term we're going to, I'm going to spend more time with my children. I'm going to spend more time with my, uh, with my wife. I'm going to spend time in the Word. I think we could do it every month, every week. I think if, you know in the book of Lamentations, it says His mercies on you every morning. I think every morning we need to make, wake up with a resolution that we're going to serve Jesus and be fully committed. And the thing with New Year's resolutions is we start off well. So the gyms are a bit fuller. The, the restaurants are a bit emptier. Um, things are slightly different in January because we've made declarations and promises that we really hope to keep. We're going to hang out with just in different environments. We, we're going to stop those things that we do. And then something happens is we, we go back to the way we used to do things. And we go, next year, or I mean, quite a few of you said, January, the diet didn't work, we'll start in February. We start these things, it doesn't work, and then we fall off. We have these commitments that we make. I'm going to serve Jesus. This year, I'm going to serve Jesus more. This year. I want to speak this morning about the reality of no longer the same. That once we make a decision to do something different, what do we have to do and what do we have to change in our lives that we don't go back to being the old person? Something of a... I spoke about it last week, and obviously many of you weren't here. You were on holiday, which is good that you went to rest. But I spoke last week about Jesus speaks about no one who puts their hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom if they look back. There's something about putting your hand to the plow, and we believe that this is the, the call of the people of Lighthouse Church this year. And I'm not saying just this year, but starting off this year, and we're going to grow into it, that everyone's going to put their hands to the plow, all hands to the plow. All hands, everyone getting involved and doing something. And I'm not talking about being busy every Sunday, but that at some stage you play a functional role in the life of this church. And the life of the church does not just happen on a Sunday morning. It happens out on the streets. It happens in, in hospitals. It happens in homes. But we go, all hands on the plow. It's my church. It's my city. Therefore, I'm going to be involved in doing something. I spoke about the invisible God wanting to make himself known through the visible church. You cannot see God, but you can see evidence of God. People cannot see what God is doing if we don't go and tell them about what God is doing. People say, oh, it was good luck, or if it was so fortunate in that incident that no one was hurt, or wow, we were so lucky. If we had been there two, two seconds earlier, the car would have hit us. The world needs to start hearing Christians and start... Seeing Christians behave, conduct themselves, and do things so that the invisible God can make himself known through the visible church. You're the visible church, by the way. It's not a building. It's us. It's people. So this morning, as I speak about all hands to the plow, what does it look like that once we start something, how do we keep going? So first of all, you've got to start somewhere. So today what you're going to do is you're going to sign up for security detail, you're going to sign up for coffee shop duty, there's kids zone, there's visitors lounge, there's hosting teams. There's, there's a, a whole team that I thought about yesterday that we're going to start that's going to be make lunch for the pastor team. And when that thought came, I knew it wasn't the devil, so I think it was God. Because the people go, well, I don't know what to do. Make somebody lunch. And go, please don't make me lunch and bring it to me. It's, I'm, for those of you a bit slow on the sarcasm, my first language is sarcasm. My second language is English. For those of you who say, well, I don't know what to do, go and love somebody. And not the pretty neighbor's wife. 
got to state the obvious. I'm talking go love the one that no one else finds desirable or loved. Go and love the hobos. Go and love the people on the street. Go and love the people that offend you. Do something like that. It starts showing the world what the invisible God looks like. So you're going to sign up today, not for the hobo lunch, not for the secretary. I'm talking about you're going to sign up today, go and fill in a feedback card, put your name down. And the wonderful thing is, I'm speaking to a church that's hyperactive. You know most churches, 20% of the people do 100% of the work. I'd say this church, we're sitting at about a, a 45 to 50% of the people doing all the work. But there's some of you sitting here this morning that do nothing. Now I know it's magical. You come to church and there happens to be biscuits that you all eat. And there happens to be wonderful people who look after your children and kids' own. And there happen to be people on stage that are highly trained and efficient and skilled and gifted. And they never practice. What happens is they rock up on a Sunday. They accidentally know everything that they need to play, how they need to sing it, intro and air. They accidentally know these things. We accidentally have people welcoming you at the door. Do you, get, do you see where I'm going? If you're in this church, if this is your home, this is the place where you say, I'm going to be involved because it's my home. Because I get to be. And you might think, we have, two be- we have two groups of people. Those that say, I'm not good enough, join a team, I'll show you that you are. And those that say, I'm too good for that, join the team, I'll show you that you're not. Amen. Don't get nervous. We're not recording you. They're recording me. They're not going to monitor you that if you nodded and said yes, they're going to track you down. But surely there has to be something in your heart that says, how do I serve you, Jesus? And it's not about preaching. It's not about serving in a a high-end ministry. There's no such thing as a high-end ministry. You serve Jesus or not. And at the same time, I'll say, you may be serving Jesus out in your workplace, and that's amazing. But there are people over here that need your love and need your care. All hands to the plow. Say it with me. My hand hand. is to the plow. So I'm going to pray. While I pray, what I want you to do is look down, close your eyes, and just smile. Your face should be quite relaxed now. And you smile as I speak this over you. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us and that you care for us. And I pray that this morning, as your word is preached over us, it'll change our hearts. It'll change our faces so the world will see that we have not been inoculated with lemon juice. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we've got to do this. Please stand up. Go to somebody that you know. It must be somebody that you know. And you go to them. You shake their hand and you say, I hope you're happier than you look. Quickly do this. I hope you're happier than you look. I hope you're as happy as you look. I hope you're happier than you look. Some of you are standing there looking so miff, you're hoping no one's going to greet you. Quickly look around. Look for somebody who's trying to be serious. Get them. Get them. Okay, you may take your seats. I want to read something to you today. I'm going to unpack it really quickly. I'm going to share with you what I believe God's saying to us. And if we don't have it, the joy of the Lord as being our strength, this year is going to be exhaust us. This year is going to flatten you. The joy of the Lord needs to be our strength. And no matter what's happening around us, we need to have this joy, this uncontainable joy. I'm so happy as to what's going on. I'm not worried about politics and politicians because Jesus put them there. And if he put them there, it's his problem. It's not my problem. And I don't have to vote for them. I'll vote for someone else. I'm going to vote for Jesus. I'm hoping I get to the booth and there's a picture of Jesus. And he says, did you want to vote for Jesus? I want to thank you, Lord. But at the same time, I don't put my faith in politics. I don't put my faith in the rand. I don't put my faith in what's happening in my job. I don't, put my, I don't put my faith in my church. I put my faith in Jesus. He's the one that's unshakable. He's the one that he's not perturbed. He's not frightened. He's not scared. He's not caught of God by what's happening. So for the love of Jesus, when you get out there, will you just go to people and go, I have the joy of the Lord. Because we run around to people and go, have you seen what it said on Facebook? Oh my gosh, it was on Facebook. It must be true. I'd never put fake news there. 
They'd never use Facebook as a, as a device to stir and provoke people politically and racially. And we look at those things and we go, oh, I've decided I'm no longer going to live in that headspace because I'm not going to look at what that says. I'm going to spend more time reading the word about what God says. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels when you get into the New Testament. And it says, it, it describes Jesus' ministry. And he'd hang out with sinners, and he'd hang out with people that are rejects of society. I read that, I go, thank you, Jesus, you would have hung out with me. I would have been one of them. And it gives four different points of view written by different guys, one being a, a, a Jewish tax collector, all the way through to disciples, and then Luke, the doctor, he, they give this whole breakdown of Jesus. Then the, the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. No, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. No, it's the Acts of the Church. No, the book of Acts, I think it's, it's telling us how we should act. This is how you should behave. So this morning as I read from the book of Acts chapter 3, this is how it teaches us to behave. Now Peter and John, verse 1, were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, raised him up. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. This morning, I want to look at the four ones. You know, he's one of those people, they were one of those people, he's one of those people, she's one of those people. I'm going to look at four of these ones. And as I look at it, it's going to apply to us at some stage, and it's going to provoke us to be the people that God's calling us to. The first one, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Those are the together ones, the ones that hang out together. That's us. That's us. We get to hang out together. We get to spend time together. We don't, we don't value being together as much as we should I value church not because I'm the lead pastor. It's kind of expected that I'll be here. But I want to be here. That's why I applied for this job. I want to be here. But I also enjoy hanging out with you. I enjoy prayer meetings. There's an example of these guys going. They're going to prayer meeting on the ninth hour. When you read about the hour in Scripture, the ninth hour is 3 o'clock in the afternoon because the zero hour in Hebrew tradition or in the Middle East, the zero hour is 6 a.m. So the, the fourth hour would be 10 a.m. So the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to pray. It's where we hang out. We act together, loving each other, caring for each other. Now I'm speaking to a whole lot of people that are sitting on a Sunday morning in a building at church, hanging out together. So I want to tell you this. What we are doing right now is an absolute biblical instruction and an example given to us here that this is what we are called to do. But we're not just limited to this. We called for so much more. So I'm challenging you. Next weekend, Friday to Saturday, we're going to be fasting. Now, it's a funny thing when South Africans fast. We don't eat for 24 hours. 95% of the world's population actually don't eat that often, and a 24-hour fast would be a normal day. But we're saying as a church, for 24 hours, we're going to have nonstop prayer from 6 p.m. on the Friday till 6 p.m., but we'll get together on the 5 p.m. on Saturday. For 24 hours, we're going to have nonstop prayer. Book an hour. Say, I'm going to be here at 11 o'clock on Friday night. And you don't have to stand up here and grab the mic and make declarations. But you can get here at 11 o'clock on a Friday evening and you can start praying for our city. You see, as we've got the theme, all hands to the plow, we're taking it further. It's all hands to the plow. And if everyone's in and if everyone's doing, so will I. I will not be left behind. So the theme is, so will I. People are being prayed for, people are praying for the sick, so will I. People are ministering the gospel, so am I. Are you good? To, are, you good are you trained? Are you able yet? Maybe not. But we're going to pray. We're going to spend time praying and fasting for 24 hours here at the church and trusting God that I will be included in what God's going to be doing. 
You see, in his plan, all of you are included. The togetherness, Peter and John, it's a PJ ministry. You go, well, I don't really fit in. I don't really look like everyone else. I don't behave like everyone else. Trust me, Peter and John did not behave like each other at all. John was the disciple. He wrote in the, in the gospel that he wrote, the book of John, he writes John, the most beloved disciple. He actually has the arrogance to write that Jesus loved him the most. He's the one that claims that he's the most loved. He's the, love, he's the, he's the one who'd be humming the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Peter... Special forces knife fighter. Because he goes up and he takes out a knife and he attacks a Roman soldier. The Roman soldiers were skilled in sword fighting and he still gets the guy's ear off. These are two such opposite guys. Peter and John. One's the fighter, one's the lover. But together they go to the temple together. I don't care what your habits are. I don't care what your ideas are. I don't care what... If you follow Jesus, we have a purpose and a plan together. Our togetherness, we can get it done. I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm smiling all the time. It excites me that I get to do church with you. It excites me that God's calling us to more. Prayer and fasting. The other day I ran out of petrol. So I phoned McDonald's and I phoned the bakery. My car's still standing without petrol. I don't know why nobody's answering me. Isn't that what we do? There's a problem, and we'll speak to our neighbors, and we'll speak to our colleagues about the problem, as opposed to going to the one who can do something about it. If you spoke, uh, to, if you spoke to God about our country, about your church, as much as you spoke to others, I think it will have a greater impact in our city. It's just an idea. But we carry. So the first ones, so the together ones. Verse 2, and a lame man from birth was being carried and they laid at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask for alms as the people enter the temple. Alms is not alms. So it says he's crippled and you think, but he hasn't got alms. No, these alms, it's a reference of money or financial support for the poor. Um, he's begging for money. What a mockery to put a man who's crippled from birth at the beautiful gate. He's the most unbeautiful thing to have to look at at the beautiful gate. When Scripture speaks about a man that's been lame since birth, a physical deformity from birth normally represents somebody who is unsaved because we, we're born unsaved, right? For we, we're born, all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God. So when Scripture's speaking about somebody who, who has an ailment from birth, we can say, can we look at this as though it's somebody that needs to encounter the gospel? Everybody needs to. So this story applies to everyone. So they would take this guy, the crippled one, and put him at the gate, and he'd sit there and beg. And all he was looking for is a handout. It says his friends would bring him for a handout. And he says to Peter and John, he says, I need money. And they look at him, and they don't give him money, but what they do is they give him something better. Do you know that there are things that you are asking for that God is not answering because... You're asking too small. Lord God, help me put my CV together. Maybe you shouldn't be praying that. Maybe you shouldn't even be praying, Lord God, just give me a job, any job. Do you sometimes pray that if you're unemployed and you're struggling? Lord, I'll do anything. And that's what happens when we lose faith is we start aiming at the lowest common denominator. If this guy just got one coin, he would have been happy. Instead of saying, guys, can you help me with my legs? would have been a silly prayer to ask these guys. But we do that with God as well. We're called to be the ones that gather, but we're also called to be the ones that go with the hope of Jesus to the ones that have no hope. We're called to be the ones that go to the spiritual cripples. We're called to be the ones that go to the spiritual cripples out there, and I'm speaking about those that don't know Jesus are spiritually crippled. And we're called to go to them, and all they want is a solution to their marital problems. They want a solution to their finances. They want a solution to their health issues. They want a solution to the issues with their children. So they ask for that. AV desk, don't worry about my notes. It's fine. Let me present this to you instead, friends. Are you the kind of friends that are taking people on a journey the way the friends of this cripple would take their friend on a journey? And every day, they 
the ones who would carry the cripple. So they take their crippled friend to the gate every day. Do some of you have friends in your life and all they do is they entertain your weakness and prop you up, because that's what they would do. They'd prop this cripple up, this little blanket, so that he could beg. And they'd say to him, we hope you get money, we hope you'll do well, we hope, and then they leave him. I'm worried that you have some friends that all they do is they're propping you up with poor ideas, they're propping up your sin by endorsing what you do. No, you don't need to go to church, you don't have to be in line. You, you don't have to be on fire for God, just normal Christianity is, is good enough. Actually, Jesus says, if you're lukewarm, he'll spit you out. But are you surrounded with friends that are kind of just propping you up with your stinky little blankie so that you can just make do? Or are you encountering people? I love Peter and John. They say to the guy, look at me. Look at me. You need to surround your friends. If you want to walk into this season, if you want to walk into this year of 2019, not going back to the muck that you were in in 2018, you don't need friends to prop you up in the mess that you were in. You need friends who say, hey, stop looking at your legs, stop looking at your mess, stop looking at your... Look at me. Take your focus off your problems. Look at me. Take your focus of where it's going wrong. Take your focus off your... Look at me. I don't have what you want. Because what you want is not what you need. But I've got the solution. His name's Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, they present Jesus, stand up and walk. And some of you are not having your wants answered because God is preparing to deal with your needs. There's stuff you need, but there's stuff you want, and God's going, actually, I'm not doing that because that's not the part of the plan. If God gives you your wants and not your needs, all would have happened is Peter and John would have given them money and God would never have been glorified. You need to change some of your friends. You need to get rid of your friends that all they do is prop you up in the mess that you're in so that you can kind of look good enough just to be... You need to stop having friends that can bring you to the outside of the temple and start relying on friends who will get you into the temple. Because what happens is he has an encounter with these men who say, look at me, take your eyes off the mess, your blanket, your crippled legs, look at me so that I can see your eyes, look at me, I don't have anything. He says, and he takes his right hand, and he puts out his right hand, and he lifts up the guy before his legs are healed. And before his legs are healed, they say they bring him up, and his legs are then restored. You need friends of faith, guys. You need friends of faith. Not friends that go, oh, tomorrow it's going to be okay. You need friends that are saying, it's not going to be okay. It's actually a chronic mess. You cripple and it's a total tax up. And if you don't have Jesus in the situation, you're going to sit in the mess for 2019, 2020, 2050. You're going to be stuck in the mess. Look at me, I promise you. Jesus is the answer. He then, right hand, right hand of friendship, right hand of authority. Where's Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father? He comes to the right hand. He says, get up, come, come, come. No longer sitting here. Get rid of the stinky blanket. Get rid of the mess. You stand up. I'm not going to have you stay at the beautiful gate because it's not that beautiful. I need you to come follow me. And he gets healed. His legs are restored. And the response is he starts praising Jesus. You need friends that say, look at me. Here's Jesus. And the response is that you praise Jesus. If your friends do not provoke you to praise Jesus, you've got to step away from those friends. Because all they want to do is see you propped up at the beautiful gate. And they seem like good friends because they're helping you. And they're getting credit for the, they're just circling you. You need somebody to say, look at me. Get off your ass. We've got something to get done. And then he ends up and he goes into the temple and he's worshiping and he's praising Jesus. And when he has this encounter with Jesus, what happens if you have all those ones that suddenly come in and they're watching? It's those ones that are watching and they come because there are people that know who you are. And after you have an encounter with Jesus, they're going to look and go, how is it possible that that drug addict serves Jesus? How is it possible that that, that rubbish gets to serve in the church? How is it possible? How is it possible that the cripple now walks and leaps and prays? Praise his God. It's because somewhere he had a friend that said, look at me, stop what you're doing, I've got more for you. His name's Jesus. Some of you need to start hanging out with those friends. And you know what? They're sitting here all over the place. And you know what? Some of you, you are those friends. Stop propping up people at work and saying, don't worry, 
I'll pray for you. And then you walk away. You go, you say, look at me. Do you know what that means? If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Peter and John, hey, I'm just a fisherman. I'm a nothing. I smell funky. I have nothing. But if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Look at me. Can I introduce you to Jesus? I'm not going to pray for you at home. When I go home, I pray for him with my family and I spend time with Look at me. I will pray for you right now. And you embarrass the whole flippant office. So that Jesus will step in. Put Jesus on the spot. Imagine if Peter had said, look at me. Grabs him by the right hand. Lifts him up and the guy flops down. My name's John. But he has the faith that Jesus is more interested to see him shift. Your friends that you encounter, when they encounter you, are they then provoked into coming into church? Because that's what happens. An encounter with a friend that serves Jesus will see your friends come into church. I'm inviting my friends to church. Wonderful. Why? So I can do all the work? So my pastors can do all the work? Or do you want to invite your friends after they have an encounter with Jesus that you can then point to them and go, I've got a place. We gather we hang out in a team because these guys, we hunt in packs. We're like wolves. We have the deer over a line. We hunt like wolves. You want to join us? We get together every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday, even Friday night. We get together. You want to join us because there's strength and unity. And you know what? The guy that's called to go from sitting at the gate, healed, called into church, is the same guy that's been called and being told, now you go and do. Freely has been given. Freely you've received. Now go and give it out freely. It's you. It's you. There's space, there's place for everyone in this race, friends. And every one of you, you called from your mess, from your crippled state. You've been called by Jesus this morning. If you're sitting here and you do not know who Jesus is, oh, he's a good, good God. And he loves you more than you'll ever believe. He all, has all the authority. He has all the power. He knows the stuff you need to actually have access to. He knows your mess. He knows you cripple. And he's standing and he's waiting for you to respond to him. So I'm saying to you, if you don't know Jesus, look at me. If he can save me, he can save you. Look at the people around you. If he can save them, he can save you. But there's also those sitting out this morning. You call to go and call out the gold in others. Stop hanging back. I have a staff member. He danced on Friday that other staff members ran away and covered their eyes and said, Jesus, Jesus, let me not see again. He's known as that guy. I will show you the video. We're busy editing it and putting music to it. So all the staff are laughing at him. I mean, this guy, you know, he wasn't throwing his name away. He had thrown it away a while ago, and then he found his name, and then he danced on it. And while everyone was laughing, I said, you know what, if I was a betting man and I had to put money on who in my staff team would go out right now and evangelize the name of Jesus, I'd put my money on him, that guy. Because he doesn't have pride. We need to set our pride aside. Peter and John never had the pride to go, uh, let's take him in the church, then we'll pray for him. Because if it doesn't work, out in public at the beautiful gate, the preferred gate, I love the fact that it says his friends would put him there. It is funny how they would put him there at the hour of prayer because surely there's an expectation that something's going to happen as all these godly people walk in. Let's, let's throw our names away a bit. Not in immorality and not in poor behavior, but in total disregard. My Jesus and the message he's given me and the gospel that I carry is more valuable and more important than the way I feel about it. Because sometimes I don't feel powerful and sometimes it doesn't feel like I have authority. But I'm called to be a Peter or a John, out of, provoked out of love or just provoked. But you called for more. Let's pray. I choose to do this while eyes are closed and heads are bowed because I don't want to embarrass anyone. But if you're sitting here this morning and you do not know the Jesus of whom I speak, you don't know Jesus of Nazareth who calls the cripples to walk and the dead to be risen. You don't know the Jesus who rejuvenates your life and gives you new life and gives you purpose. If all you've ever known is a religious activity, if all you've ever known is just you go to church and you didn't realize that you are the church, if you feel powerless and helpless because you do not know Jesus and you've never called on the name of Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to call you to the front, but before I call anyone, I want to see, I want you to get your hands up in absolute courage. 
There's no reason why today is not the best day for you to give your life to Jesus. Well done, sir. I can see that hand. I want you to keep it up a little bit longer, please. Is there anyone else? I don't need more. Well done, sir. I don't need more people to raise their hands, but I cannot have you walk out here. I cannot stand here and not say to you, look at me, he loves you so much. Look at me, he cares for you so much. There's so much more for you. The guys that have raised their hands, can I ask you to please come to the front? Please come to the front. You popped your hand up. You've been courageous. Let's move. Well done. Well done, sir. Well done. Let me get some of my pastors to stand with you. And they're going to pray with you now. Guys can hang back. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Well done. Perhaps you're sitting there and you need to come up. Maybe you're worried about what other people will think. Trust me, if they're the good friends, they'll celebrate. If they're not your friends, you need to make new ones. Anyone else? All right, now while everyone's looking around, if you don't have the courage and you get nervous and you get scared to be the one to go and say to somebody, rise up, stand up and walk. And I'm not talking about just the literal cripples. If you are nervous to speak about Jesus, I'm praying this morning that God is going to give you a fresh dose of courage so that you'll be so provoked you're not going to go, I'm not sure if I'm courageous enough. You're going to start hunting for people to minister to. If you need a dose of courage, you need some guts delivered to you this morning. Because it says that faith and courage, it's a, it's a gift from God. Will you stand, please? If you're too nervous to stand, you're the one I want to pray for. I'll wait another five seconds. Think about it. Don't, st don't stand if you, do, if you don't want to go and speak to people. I'm, I'm, st I'm saying this morning, if you're the one, you know that God's calling you for more and you're just too nervous to do it. Stand up. So Holy Spirit, I pray an anointing over every single person standing here this morning that is saying, I need more courage, I need more courage, I need more courage to be able to speak what you're calling me to do. Lord, I pray for those that, are, that have opportunities waiting for them to spread the gospel. Something's already been set up for them. I pray, Lord God, for an opportunity like never before to be released over them. Holy Spirit, come. Bless them with faith and courage with absolute disregard for their reputation. So we'll become world changers. We pray this in Jesus' name over them. Amen.